All right. Um, thanks, Tim, and thanks for organizing to Tim and Sarah for organizing this webinar series. Um, I think uh, timely to have us to switch to webinar series uh, during this during this period. So I hope everyone's doing all right. And thanks for thanks for tuning in. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, some work we've been doing in the as part of the Shale Hills Critical Zone Observatory, the Susquehanna Shale Hills Critical Zone Observatory, and in particular talking about the the asking the question of how climate and geology precondition the response of upland watersheds to human impacts. And the title slide here, I'm showing two images side by side, um, showing end members of landscapes on the left uh, where in Pennsylvania, where we have um, watersheds that the architecture reflects the control of Pleistocene climate forcing um, and has a dominant signature, the sort of long-term imprint on the landscape um, has, was little affected by human impact. On the right is sort of the other end member in the, in the Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic Piedmont in Pennsylvania, where the watershed architecture here reflects a strong, has a strong impact uh, shown of the anthropogenic legacy of mill dams um, and soil erosion from associated deforestation. And so we're gonna be looking at both why, you know, trying to understand um, whether or not we can predict, you know, which landscapes are more resilient or not based on their geologic history and the human uh, history of human impact. Um, the work that I'm going to be presenting today is primarily the, the result of um, uh, two th students of mine at Penn State, graduate students, uh, Joan Marie Del Vecchio, who's a PhD student working with me, and then Perry Silverheart, who is a master's student who just uh, finished up. Um, and this work was, was funded through NSF, uh, through the Critical Zone Observatory Program. Um, and then some of the work I'm showing is, was also supported by uh, seed money from the Penn State Institutes of Energy and the Environment. Um, and then we're working on the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources land in uh, Pennsylvania. And a lot of the data that I'm showing here today, uh, the LIDAR data was collected by the National Center for Airborne Laser Mapping, which is a NSF funded center. Um, there's also a number of people I just wanted to give a shout out to that helped uh, with various aspects of what I'll present today, um, both with, you know, cosogenic nuclide work at Paul Bierman's lab at UVM, uh, short-lived isotopes work that we did here at Penn State and also Franklin and Marshall, and then radiocarbon work that we did at, at Penn State. And then a lot of the shallow geophysics that I'm showing is in collaboration with Xavier Comas at Florida Atlantic, Greg Mount at IUP in Pennsylvania, and then Jordan uh, Hayes at Dickinson. And then a lot of these ideas are um, come out of uh, work in collaboration with Sue Brantley, Jason Kay, uh, and others uh, at Penn State. All right, um, so the big question I wanna get at today is thinking about how does the geologic history impact the resilience of landscapes? And, and so the, the couple images I'm showing here are um, examples showing landscapes that maybe we can characterize as being not resilient, at least in terms of sediment. So the top image on the right is uh, ex sort of extreme soil erosion, um, along the, uh, uh, from anthropogenic farming in uh, gullying associated with that in South Carolina. This is an image from the 1950s um, in response to sort of direct human impact. Um, and, the, and the bottom right here, I'm showing an image of a retrogressive thaw slump in the uh, Alaskan Arctic. That's a response uh, responding to warming and, and global climate change. And so the questions we want to get at is how do we understand, you know, what determines the landscape resilience to perturbations from things like land use and climate change. Um, and this becomes problematic even in asking the questions because we don't necessarily know what we mean by landscape resilience up front. And so this could mean something related to soil erosion, sediment or nutrient loading in streams, vegetation, ecosystem recovery. Um, and so there's, there's a, you know, this turns out to be a, a a challenge just in terms of figuring out what questions to ask. Um, but overall, we wanna know, you know, the, the, the basic ideas, we wanna know, um, you know, if you, if you perturb a landscape, does it, does, it, does it return to its previous condition or does it switch over into, into a new state? 
Um, another way of thinking about this is not just in terms of um, the sort of sediment or physical changes in the landscape, but in the in the chemistry. So this is an example of uh, a cross section of an agricultural field um, showing pathways of nitrate uh, from a, you know fertilizer application on a field into stream waters, and we might be interested in trying to understand the fate of nitrate in streams and to answer this question we need to know something about the subsurface pathways of water through the landscape and this is determined by the subsurface geology and so if we know something about the pattern of you know how deep the uh, it is to that boundary between oxic and anoxic groundwater this will help us to determine the effectiveness of uh, you know things like riparian uh, buffer zones along streams uh, that are that are planted for denitrification um, and so right now we have you know sometimes these work and sometimes they don't and so one of the the hypotheses uh, that we're working with here is to think about if we know something about the subsurface geology can this help uh, us to better plan um, our, our uh, response uh, to these types of perturbations and then finally, as a, as a geologist, we think about how can we use our understanding of geologic history to better predict uh, the landscape uh, response to these perturbations and how can we predict or can we predict patterns of resilience in landscapes. Um, so this is an, an example in, of um, showing a, a block diagram through the geology of the uh, Shavers Creek watershed as part of the Susquehanna Shale Hills Critical Zone Observatory. Um, and I'm going to show mainly work from this, you know, watershed, but the, we're, we're going to be thinking about this in a broader sense of how can we um, bring sort of, you know, questions about deep time and the deep subsurface uh, into um, problems related uh, to, to landscape response at the surface. Okay, so um, the Earth's critical zone is this interface between air, water, rock, and life. And this is where, um, you know, this zone between the, the sort of tops of the trees down uh, to, the, to the interface of fresh un unweathered bedrock. And there's a number of different um, processes that are acting here that are um, connected across a range of timescales. So these are, you know, physical, chemical, and biological processes. Um, that have feedbacks that tend to lead towards equilibrium forms. And so if we understand those interactions, we might be able to predict the patterns of uh, the subsurface structure, the topography, the vegetation. Um, we might be able to predict this across landscapes. Um, the challenge though is that the forcing to these landscapes is not steady. Um, so this could be you know, geologic forcing, climatic forcing, anthropogenic forcing. And the and the uh, the forcing is not is not steady, and the modern processes that we observe today depend on the legacy that's left behind by these past conditions. And so, if we want to sort of both read the history of this past legacy in the landscape, and also to understand the implications for modern processes, this requires us to characterize both the architecture of the critical zone both the surface uh, architecture that's easier to observe and the, and the subsurface architecture that is uh, much more difficult to observe. And then we need to, to place this history into context. We need rates and dates. So we need to know how fast these processes are occurring and how long the sort of legacy of these perturbations sticks around in these landscapes. And this is where, um, this, is, this is really where sort of critical zone science can um, help contribute to thinking about modern problems is by providing this context of, uh, of both deep time uh, and, and sort of deep in a, in a, in a literal sense in the, into the subsurface. Okay, so for this talk, I'm gonna be um, talking mainly about work at the uh, Shale Hills uh, Critical Zone Observatory, which is within the Susquehanna River Basin. In, Pencil in Pennsylvania. And so uh, here's Harrisburg for, for context. Um, you know, Penn State is the star right here. Um, and the Susquehanna River Basin is outlined in black here, and it's the largest contributing watershed to uh, Chesapeake Bay. Um, and our hypothesis here for the, the that's guiding um, 
this, this work and our future work is the idea that the geologic history of landscapes is going to precondition the, the response to modern um, processes. And so in particular, um, I'm going to sort of gear this talk, uh, we'll, end, we'll end up at the end of this talk thinking about how the geologic history preconditions um, the geomorphological and biogeochemical response to agriculture in, in particular. Um, and so to do that, we need to untangle a series of different legacies that are uh, affecting the critical zone form and function in the Susquehanna River Basin. Um, and so I'll, I'll work through these starting sort of farthest back in time and moving up to present. Um, and the first order control here is if we look at the, the topography of uh, the Susquehanna River Basin. So this is in the backdrop is colorized by elevation with the browns as high elevation and the light greens as low elevation. The large scale topography here is controlled by Paleozoic mountain building and the variation in rock strength that's associated with the different geologic strata that were laid down. So we have on the Appalachian Plateau to the west, uh, you, you can almost draw a boundary just based on the topography here between the sort of gently folded Paleozo Paleozoic strata on the Appalachian Plateau and then the valley and ridge um, uh, that is characterized by these steeply folded Paleozoic strata. And so superimposed on this kind of first order control from the underlying geology um, is a Miocene, what's thought to be a Miocene aged river incision uh, that's propagating through the Appalachian Plateau. So you can see sort of superimposed on this um, uh, plateau to the north, uh, to the northwest, you have these river canyons that are cut down uh, into the topography. And this is a, thought to be reflecting a boundary between uh, slowly eroding surfaces on the upper part of the plateau and rejuvenated higher, uh, more rapidly eroding canyons cutting through it. And then on top of all of this, so in the quaternary, we have the Laurentide ice sheet that comes in from the uh, northeast. So this is the blue dashed line here corresponds to the ice extent of the, uh, uh, during the last glacial maximum. And we have um, an area that is both glaciated in the northeast part of the basin and then to the southwest, sort of beyond the ice uh, limit, um, we have an area that was um, impacted by quaternary climate change uh, through the onset of paraglacial climate conditions. And so this is evident in the topography of the landscape that you can see in the bare earth LIDAR uh, topography um, throughout Pennsylvania and the, the mid-Atlantic. And so just a couple examples here of the types of landforms that you see that give us clues to this past uh, uh, climate imprint are in the, in the bottom here is an, an example of solid fluxion lobes um, that are filling a, a, a valley um, that I'll come back to uh, a little bit later in the talk. And then on the top left, this is a maybe a, a 15 degree hillside that has uh, this uh, large translation, translational slide um, that's likely related to permafrost thaw. And you see features like this throughout the paraglaciated, uh, paraglaciated parts of, this, uh, of, of Pennsylvania. And then most recently, sort of starting in maybe the 1700s <clears throat> to 1800s, uh, depending on, on where you are, um, you have a, a strong anthropogenic impact on the landscape. And this ranges from uh, sort of today, maybe the, the most dramatic is uh, surface mining for, for coal, um, but you also have you know, widespread deforestation of the whole state that happened um, you know, multiple times uh, throughout the 1800s and early 1900s. And then the sort of ubiquitous presence of mill dams, uh, like the one shown here at the, at the bottom left, uh, particularly in the, in the mid-Atlantic uh, Piedmont. Um, and so this is going to lead to a strong um, imprint on the landscape, both in terms of the, um, you know, their controls on uh, soil erosion and the uplands, and then the trapping of sediment um, in valleys in, in along valley, uh, valley bottoms. So the challenge here is we, we look at a landscape that has these multiple uh, sort of inner, inner Twined uh, legacies, and we want to understand how do we disentangle these effects. 
of geology, climate, and land use? And then how do we you know, think about the implications of this legacy for modern critical zone processes? Um, and so for this talk, I have sort of three sections that I'm gonna um, focus on. Um, the first is taking a look at how sandstone and shale watersheds uh, responded differently to Pleistocene paraglaciation. And so this is gonna be thinking about, in a, in a way, the resilience, how the underlying geology controls the resilience of landscapes uh, to a strong climate perturbation. And then for the second part of the talk, I'm gonna go through how we disentangle the role of climate forcing from human impact on thinking about the, the origin of sediment fills and headwater valleys. Um, and then I'll finish up by uh, providing some, some ideas about how we're moving forward to think about um, the using our understanding of geology, climate, and land use history to better predict landscape resilience. And, and in particular, um, you know, how landscapes are, are, um, may or may not be resilient uh, to, to agriculture. Okay, so the study area for the for most of this talk is going to be uh, the Shavers Creek watershed, um, which is a 165 square kilometer watershed uh, just south of the Penn State uh, campus here. And this is um, a microcosm of the greater valley and ridge uh, landscape uh, in the Appalachians. And it, is, uh, it has a diverse geology. So we have sandstone, shales, and carbonates, um, just all within the same small watershed here. Um, it was nearby the ice extents uh, during the um, Pleistocene ice advances. So we have strong climate perturbations throughout the Pleistocene. And then um, within this watershed, we have a pretty variable land use history. And so um, variable, both in terms of um, what was farmed and what wasn't, the timing, you know, areas that have uh, were farmed initially have been converted to forest. We have large areas of charcoal production. Um, so we have some, some way of uh, interrogating these patterns as well. So we'll zoom in now to the Shavers Creek watershed and the Susquehanna Shale Hills Critical Zone Observatory. And the, on the left here, I'm showing three maps that show the elevation uh, and the top, and then the geology, the bedrock geology, and then on the bottom, the land use. So this land use is based off of uh, satellite, uh, uh, satellite imagery. And so you can immediately see that there's a strong connection between the topography and the geology here, where the sandstone ridges uh, prop up the, the sort of high topography in the watershed and the shale and carbonate rocks uh, form the sort of lower uh, topography. And we're going to focus on three subcatchments um, that have varying lithology and land use as a, as a way to investigate these questions. Um, the first uh, is the Shale Hills watershed. So this is the uh, Shale Hills catchment um, that's been you know, sort of heavily studied and part of the CD as part of the CZO since 2007. Um, this is a shale forested catchment. Um, then the second catchment that we'll talk about is the Garner Run catchment. So Garner Run is a sandstone forested catchment that we started looking at uh, right around when I got to Penn State in 2014. And then more recently, we started working at um, Coal Farm, which is a, a, a private farm that uh, we've been working on that's an um, uh, agricultural catchment that's underlain by uh, calcareous shales. And we've been working there since about 2017. So the first question I wanna get at here is, is trying to understand how did sandstone and shale watersheds respond to Pleistocene paraglaciation? And you know, to, to do this, we're looking at two very different um, rock types. Uh, in Pennsylvania, the, the Tuscarora sandstone is one of the more resistant units that we have uh, in the stratigraphy. So this is a, um, a quartz-rich uh, sandstone um, that is incredibly, uh, you know, erosion resistant. And, you know, it's a type of thing that if you, you know, you ping it with a hammer and it, and it just uh, sings. And so this produces this characteristic type of uh, boulder field that gets produced in these uh, sandstone landscapes. Um, and so this is, you know, you can think of this as the end member for um, erosionally resistant rocks. 
And then um, on the other side, we're looking at the Rose Hill Shale, which is an, um, uh, an organic, poor, iron-rich shale. Uh, here's an image of what it looks like um, in a, in a uh, cut, a road cut. And so you can see it's sort of, um, you know, it's a chippy shale that has thin beds, lots of fractures in it, and it's um, much more readily erodible. So the questions we're going to be looking at here is we have these two landscapes that are, you know, just a few kilometers apart from each other. And presumably we're subject to similar climate forcing throughout the Pleistocene. And we want to look at what is the, the reflection of that in the architecture, the critical zone architecture of these watersheds. Um, we'll look at the erosion rates in these landscapes. Um, and then think about the memory of each landscape in terms of how long you know, what, what is the legacy that's preserved in these landscapes um, to, that we want to, uh, that we can read the history of. Okay, so to do this, uh, we use a, a number of different tools. The, uh, the first one is to use LIDAR bare earth topography. So this is um, an image on the right showing uh, a LIDAR point cloud um, that has the, you know, vegetation canopy colorized as green and then the ground surface uh, uh, colorized as orange here. And so in a forested landscape uh, like Pennsylvania, if you want to look at the surface topography um, in any detail, you really need um, to have uh, sort of high resolution LIDAR data to capture that ground surface. So we're going to be using large scale mapping of surface morphology at, at high resolution uh, from airborne LIDAR. Um, and then to investigate the, the surface and subsurface directly, um, we have a mix of of sort of soil and surface cover mapping. Um, this is uh, Joe Marie out sort of walking throughout the, the Garner Run watershed mapping um, boulder cover. Um, and this is something that's, you know, hard to do with air photos again because of the trees. So it requires uh, sort of on the ground uh, mapping. And then to access the subsurface uh, to either invest, interrogate the architecture or collect samples um, to, to measure um, you know, to, to, to measure, measure things, uh, we need to core through the landscape. So um, this is, you know, a combination of wells and coring using various degrees of heavy machinery. Um, this is an example of a, a sonic core through boulder-rich colluvium, uh, like the stuff on the right uh, near an area just to the north of our, our watershed. Um, and then to, to expand those point measurements into um, sort of more regional uh, subsurface mapping, we rely on uh, shallow geophysics. And so these are, uh, you know, primarily a combination of seismic refraction surveys. This is um, uh, an example of some REU students, uh, undergraduates working over the summer with us. And then on the right, this is um, showing ground penetrating radar, in this case with uh, uh, using an unshielded um, rough terrain antenna to sort of work through uh, these types of uh, rugged landscapes. And then finally to, uh, to look at the timing of, of how landscapes, uh, how fast landscapes are eroding, what the resonance time of materials in these landscapes are, um, <clears throat> we're using a combination of different isotopic sediment tracers uh, that span multiple time scales. So we're looking at you know, everything from uh, million year uh, time scales from um, burial, cosmogenic uh, nuclide dating um, to sort of short term uh, soil redistribution from fallout radionuclides. Okay, um, so the first, you know, the first example here that I want to I want to walk through is, is work that was done um, primarily by uh, sort of Nikki West and a number of other collaborators at the, the Shale Hills that happened uh, just before I got to, to Penn State. And so this was looking at the, the Shale Hills catchment and to try to characterize um, the architecture, the erosion rates and the resonance times and material here and to try to explain kind of the first order observations of um, this asymmetry um, between the morphology and subsurface architecture of uh, south-facing hillside on the left here and the north-facing hillside on the on the right of, of the catchment. And so we have this asymmetry in 
in slope so that you have steeper uh, slopes in the north facing slopes and also thicker soils and, and sort of thicker patterns of uh, fractured rock in the subsurface that we can um, in, infer from shallow geophysical surveys and uh, a handful of cores. Um, the erosion rates for this landscape are fairly uniform. So despite this asymmetry in topography and uh, architecture, the erosion rates are interpreted to be similar across the landscape. Um, and the erosion rates here are on the order of 15 to 20 meters per million years. Um, and this is from uh, mainly from Meteoric Brilliant 10 data from NICU West. Um, the, you can think about the soil residence time that's associated with this. Um, and, and in the simplest sense, this is just the thickness of the soil divided by the erosion rate. And this is on the order of say 20,000 years. So um, on the time scale, you know, the memory in this landscape is on the order of um, the time since the, the last glacial maximum. Um, the fractured rock residence time, if you think about a, a parcel of rock coming up through the surface, and the memory of you know, material that's in that upper, say eight to 10 meters of, of, the, uh, of the critical zone, um, the residence time there is, is much longer, of course. And so the take, the take home here and the interpretation from, uh, from Nikki's work is that the, the shaded north facing slopes um, in, this, uh, in this watershed and, and, and by inference elsewhere throughout uh, central Pennsylvania and shale landscapes have deeper penetration of frost cracking during paraglacial climates. And this leads to thicker regolith production. So uh, thicker regolith, both the soil as well as the fractured bedrock underneath um, on, the, on the north facing slopes. The opposite side on the warmer south facing slopes um, this is thought to result in more efficient downslope soil delivery um, during, uh, during warming periods. And the idea here is that because these uh, hill slopes are mantled with soil, this, it's the efficiency of soil transport that's controlling the morphology of the landscape here. And so the idea, the in interpretation is that um, the topography is reflecting this contrast in uh, soil transport that emerges from a, a sort of microclimate differences during, uh, uh, during paraglacial times. And then the last piece I wanna highlight here is that the, the valley fill in shale hills, there's a, there's a maybe two to three meter thick accumulation of sediment in the valley axis. Uh, and there's some um, radiocarbon dates on that, that that pin this to being greater than about a thousand years at, le at, a, at a minimum. And so this is um, not reflecting sort of uh, you know, mill dam accumulation or human uh, accelerated erosion rates on the hillsides uh, from human impact. Okay, so now given that, let's go to uh, the Garner Run catchment. And this is, um, this is work that uh, is primarily uh, uh, my, uh, uh, by my student, Jo Marie Del Vecchio during her master's thesis. Um, and so the Garner Run catchment is a sandstone landscape um, and it, it has some fundamentally different characteristics than the Shale Hills watershed. The first is that the hill slopes are near dip slopes and so the uh, morphology of the hill slopes is set by those um, Paleozoic structures. So we have the dip of the sandstone here is controlling the shape of the hillsides. And there's very little dissection of that sandstone bedrock in comparison to the Shale Hills watershed um, that has been sort of carved into valleys and ridges, um, ir almost ir irrespective of the structure. Um, the hill slopes are characterized by abundant boulder fields, like I showed in the couple slides ago, and coarse grained soils. Um, and then you'll notice that there's a large, wide, low sloping valley fill here. Um, and so there's this low sloping valley fill is um, consist of coarse sediment that's derived from the, the adjacent hill slopes. And as a consequence of this, the stream, there's a, you can see a little stream channel here is choked with coarse boulders. Um, and there's very little evidence for, for transport by water um, in this part of the, the landscape. Um, so we have this strong contrast to shale hills and we want to understand how this geology, the underlying sandstone geology, um, influences the sensitivity of the landscape to Pleistocene climate change. So types of questions we're going to be asking are, you know, how thick 
how fast and, and how old, right? All right, so this image, um, a series of images sort of gives you a sense of the, the patterns of both the, the surface topography from the LIDAR, the surface mapping, and the bottom left from uh, sort of boots on the ground mapping of surface cover, and then some subsurface imaging from um, uh, shallow seismic uh, tomography, P wave tomography. Um, and the, a couple things I wanna highlight here is that in just from the LIDAR, you can observe uh, in the surface morphology, these characteristic solid flexion lobes that make up uh, sort of this lobate deposit that is um, that we're inferring to be derived mainly from the left side of the image here. So Tussie Mountain is a, is this um, the northern uh, ridge line. Um, and if you look at this map of surface cover, this asymmetry in the direction of where we're getting sort of surface transport of uh, material from solid fluxion lines up with patterns of where you've exhumed or exposed uh, sort of open boulder fields and sort of those um, really uh, bouldery soils and deposited more fine grain material in the valley floor. And we've kept that sort of finer grained soil uh, material more on the other slope that's experienced less transport. So again, fine grained soils here is, um, is sort of still relative, right? Is relative to, to boulders. So just as a, as a um, context. The other thing when we peer into the subsurface is that the pattern of delivery of material from solid fluxion um, lines up with uh, you know, the, the, the patterns of where we infer thicker sediment packages in the subsurface lines up with that um, uh, increased delivery of uh, material from solid fluxion. So the reds here correspond to velocities that are below uh, about a thousand um, meters per second. And we're in interpreting this to be the sort of boundary of sediment fill in the subsurface. And we have about up to 20 meters thick of this colluvial sediment fill um, in, the, in the valley that agrees with the patterns of the surface cover um, and the solid flexion lobes visible in the LIDAR. So we have most of the material here is shed from the south facing slope of Tussie Mountain um, consistent with, and this is consistent with observations just based on LIDAR surface topography elsewhere in Appalachia. We can look at the, the hillsides. It's a little tricky to do the shallow seismic uh, surveys on these boulder fields, but we can use ground penetrating radar to make, interpretation, uh, make interpretations about the shallow subsurface um, in these sandy soils. Um, and so we can use this combined with um, interpretations of how deep we can dig soil pits um, to give us uh, a sort of stratigraphy of the upper, um, say, 10 meters of the subsurface in, in Garner Run. So this is a cross section going from Tussie Mountain to Leading Ridge, right? The same sort of cross section line as this uh, lower right image here. And what we can see is a pattern where, again, you have uh, the sort of um, uh, GPR velocities correspond to the shallow uh, fine grain soils primarily on the, the north facing slope. And on the south facing slope, you've lost that material and left behind uh, this sort of bouldery lag uh, below that. Um, the thickness of those soils, the surface soils is about one to two meters, but that thickness of this bouldery colluvium um, is, is, can extend up to about eight, uh, eight meters in thickness. Um, the thickness of the fractured bedrock that we can infer from the limit of where we sort of stop seeing uh, GPR reflectors in the subsurface um, gets down about 12 to 15 meters. And so these are all much thicker than the observations from the shale hills uh, uh, that I showed uh, earlier. And again, the asymmetry in the shallow subsurface is mirroring what we're observing at the surface. Um, to get at the erosion rates and age of the valley fill in this landscape, uh, we used a com you know, we used beryllium 10 uh, measurements uh, from both surface sediments and soils um, to get at erosion rates for the watershed of about six and a half meters per million years. And if we think about this uh, in terms of that soil residence time on the hill slope, um, that corresponds to, to residence times of at least 150,000 years. 
um, and greater if you're thinking about the residence time of that bold, the total boulder equilibrium on the hillsides. Um, we also have data from a core. So where the arrow is here in this image is um, a nine meter core through colluvium uh, that we were able to date three uh, buried uh, clasts. So these are um, buried boulders that we drilled through. And based on the, uh, the ratio of uh, beryllium and aluminum in these cores and combining that with information from the, the surface samples, um, we could constrain a minimum burial depth um, for the sort of upper, for, for material at about six meters depth um, as 340,000 uh, years or more. So the fill here, the key here, right, this time scale is an order of magnitude greater than that um, that, we that was found at uh, shale hills. Um, the erosion rates are much slower, right? Um, and this corresponds to this landscape having a, a memory that um, spans multiple glacial interglacial periods. And so the, the key here also is that the fill that's delivered from the hillsides into the streams is coarse enough that it's not evacuated uh, during the interglacials. And this leads to this landscape being a long, long term sediment trap. Okay, I want to um, provide just sort of this is uh, some newer work that uh, Joe Marie's been doing. Um, in, a, in an area just to the northeast of our watershed in Shavers Creek. Um, this is in a, a Holocene um, uh, to present peat bog in, called Bear Meadows. Um, and, this is, and this is an area where we've been working to try to um, find an area that is, is sort of an even better sediment trap than at Garner Run and trying to, to find the area that preserves um, the longest record of um, both paleo erosion and also paleoecology um, records. So the, the idea is here that we might be preserving sort of not just the most recent um, sort of uh, recovery from glaciation or paraglaciation, but also sort of um, uh, uh, previous episodes um, throughout the Pleistocene. So we've been doing this through a combination of um, uh, bog cores, so cores within the, the Bear Meadows bog, uh, primarily looking at um, the sedimentological response to warming since the last glacial maximum, um, and then the, that pairing that with the ecology record. Um, but then also, and this is sort of more closely related to the Garner Run example I showed in the previous slide, we have a 20 meter core on a hill slope uh, that goes through sort of six meters of solid fluxion lobe material. Um, a paraglacial colluvium um, and into the underlying uh, saprolite. So we think uh, based on the observations from the core and from beryllium and aluminum uh, measurements of uh, sands from this core, um, we think we can um, characterize um, not just the sort of depositional age of the upper six meters of this uh, colluvium, um, which we're con we have uh, aluminum beryllium ratios that require this to be older than about 750,000 years. Um, but we also have uh, some evidence from uh, aluminum and beryllium concentrations in the underlying saprolite that this is a pre paraglacial saprolite that records um, erosion rates prior to the, to the onset of paraglaciation that we think is you know, consistent with lower. Um, erosion rates. There's a lot of uh, noise and sort of uncertainty in these data, um, but we think it's consistent with something on the order of a, you know, one or two meters per million years. So there's, um, we're still working on this, so more, more to come from, from Joan Marie. Um, the the take-home though is that this is a, these structural traps in these sandstone landscapes um, preserve these longer uh, long-term records of uh, both sediment and then potentially um, uh, uh, records of, of the ecological response as well. Okay, so to synthesize that, um, that the sandstone landscapes are slowly eroding, they have thick soils, the colluvial fill spans multiple glacial interglacial cycles, uh, and is a long-term archive for this past climate ecology and erosion. And the topography reflects these Paleozoic tectonic structures. And the shale landscapes, in contrast, have higher erosion rates, uh, thin soils that integrate over tens of thousands of years, and the topography may have equilibrated to the Pleistocene uh, climate forcing. 
And so the potential here is that, um, you know, the absence of fills in these landscapes uh, potentially is a lithologic influence on, on their preservation. So we have two different uh, examples here of basically showing how the ge underlying geology controls the landscape resilience to climate change. Okay, so the second part here, um, I'll try to move along a little quicker, uh, is disentangling climate from human impact on sediment fills in these headwater valleys. So I showed at Garner Run, we have this strong influence of, of uh, solid fluxion lobes in a landscape with little influence of human modification. This contrasts with much of the Mid-Atlantic Piedmont in this uh, diagram from uh, the Walter and Merritt's paper in 2008 um, that showed very clearly that the dominant control on this valley fill architecture in these landscapes is anthropogenic sediment trapped behind mill dams. And so how do we distinguish between these uh, two? Can we, can we look at the sort of variations in which parts of the landscapes have had more or less of, of one of these forcings uh, or another? So to do this, we've been working at the Coal Farm Study Area, which is um, uh, a privately owned farm that's been farmed since 1814 uh, and then transitioned to no-till in the late 1970s. Um, it's the, the geology here is, is a calcareous shale bedrock and there's thin soils on the hillsides um, as sort of half meter to two meters thick. And then in the valley axis, there's a uh, four meter thick valley fill in the valley axis. So the question we're asking is whether we can untangle climate from land use impact on critical zone processes here. So to do this, we looked at uh, the spatial pattern of soil thickness across the landscape both from digging soil pits, uh, here's Perry in one of her soil pits, um, and then also from augering uh, throughout the whole watershed. I'm not showing that on here. Um, and then we, we put this on a cross section going from ridge to ridge, um, showing patterns of soil thickness as you move from the ridge lines down to the valley floor. And the soils tend to be thicker in the valleys and a little bit thinner on the mid slopes, um, but we don't see any strong signatures of soil erosion. And the key here is there's similar soil thicknesses on these landscapes to uh, non-farmed watersheds of similar bedrock. Um, we also went out into this valley fill. So there's about a four meter thick valley fill in the axis of this watershed uh, that we cored and um, uh, looked for uh, material to date with radiocarbon. Uh, we measured uh, organic uh, carbon as a function of depth. And the key here is that um, the, uh, we see no buried organic carbon spike that might suggest that you have a, a recent influx of, uh, of soil um, erosion. And then we have uh, charcoal dates and then some bulk soil radiocarbon dates that suggest that this is a longer lived uh, accumulation than, than anthropogenic uh, soil erosion. We also looked at uh, cesium-137 inventories in soil pits along two transects. Um, and the idea here is that the cesium is reflecting uh, the soil redistribution since uh, about 1963 or the peak fallout from bomb testing. Um, so we see in the profiles, we can see a little bit of a mixing profile and depth profiles compared to, um, uh, to forested soil pits. Um, but the, the take home here is that the overall inventories, the total cesium inventories, um, don't vary systematically with distance downslope. There's often more variability from pit to pit at any given location than there is on, uh, on the trajectory downslope. And maybe most importantly is that the inventories in the valley fill core down to a meter and a half um, have similar total inventories to the soil pits. Um, and these are all sort of within the rough estimates of regional uh, fallout and, and similar to the inventories from uh, some unpublished data, shale hills and, and other areas. Um, the take home is that the, there's no systematic patterns here of erosion or deposition, um, at least sort of, you know, since the 1960s, aside from the mixing in the upper, say, 20 centimeters of these profiles. So to summarize uh, and expand out um, to from the coal farm watershed to all of Shavers Creek, um, 
Perry had also done some mapping here of the evidence for charcoal hearths. So each of these um, black dots is a, is a charcoal hearth uh, that was an area where um, uh, that's left, you can map these in the LIDAR pretty cleanly. Um, and then the blue are area are uh, historic mill dams. And so by looking at the, the LIDAR topography of this uh, landscape, um, despite, you know, this, despite 200 years of cultivation, um, we see limited evidence, not just within Coal Farm, but throughout the watershed of higher sediment accumulation um, behind uh, these mill dams. Um, so it's a, it suggests that our observations at, at Coal Farm um, have, are, are indicative of a landscape resilience in the Valley and Ridge um, relative to the, to the Piedmont um, region and to the Southeast uh, in Southeastern Pennsylvania. And so this is now this sort of conundrum uh, where, you know, we, we've sort of just been working with this in the last year or so is now driving questions about trying to understand what it is that's, that's causing um, this contrast and resilience between the Valley and Ridge and the, and the Piedmont region of, of Pennsylvania. So is this related to the timing and intensity of the land use? So there's some uh, thought that um, you know, the farming here started later than, uh, than in the Piedmont and sort of, you know, different styles of land clearing might have occurred. Um, and, and then the other, the other culprit could potentially be differences in the geology or climate history of the landscape that impacts the, the soil texture. Um, and so these could, you know, we have some hints that these could be rockier soils than in the Piedmont, but it's something that we're um, starting to starting to work on in, in more detail. Okay, um, so with the, the last few minutes here, I want to walk through just um, a couple ways that we're starting to approach this problem uh, moving forward and how we can better use the understanding of geology, climate, and land use history um, to predict landscape resilience. Um, and so we're approaching this problem from a couple different angles. Uh, the first is to use a long-term record uh, to investigate landscape response to past climate change. Um, and, and then the second is to exploit these gradients in land use, geology, and paleoclimate to understand uh, how those factors control the modern critical zone. And then the third point is to link the subsurface geologic models with biogeochemistry, hydrology, Etc. to understand the implications, not just for, uh, for erosion, but also for uh, solute fluxes. Okay, so, um, so here is a, uh, an image showing this sort of long-term record that's preserved in the topography of the landscape and trying to think about how we can use our observations from Appalachia to constrain uh, paraglacial surface process models. So these are currently sort of, you know, under development and trying to work with um, uh, tools like land, the land lab framework to plug in, you know, subsurface hydrology and um, paraglacial transport processes into these models and think about how we can use um, the record uh, that's preserved in the topography of landscapes. Like this is an example of as you move south, the sort of increased dissection of similar geologic uh, uh, features like anticlines of the Tuscarora sandstone and how we can use this and maybe compare it to, uh, and to use these models to say something about um, modern permafrost landscapes uh, responding to warming. Um, the second thing we're doing is trying to think about how to exploit gradients in land use, geology, and paleoclimate to understand the controls on the modern critical zone. Um, and so in, in Pennsylvania, uh, in the Susquehanna watershed, we have two opposing gradients uh, here. We have a gradient of uh, land use, whereby the, the sort of, this is a map showing mill density, the historical mill dam density from uh, uh, Walter and Merritt's uh, compilation that decreases as you move up uh, north in the watershed. And this opposes the sort of Im the impact from, you know, glacial, uh, you know, ice cover in the farthest northern parts of the landscape to strong paraglacial impact in the valley and ridge 
to sort of, you know, different or weaker um, climate controls as you move south. Um, and so we want to understand what drives the apparent resilience of watersheds in central Pennsylvania, uh, like the coal farm example I showed, um, despite the fact that these are steeper than the Piedmont watersheds. So this is an example of Conewago Creek, where you have these large scale valley fills that have accumulated um, behind these uh, mill dams and are now being re-incised. So that's the CW point right here. So what is doing this and is, it, is there something systematic about these gradients in both human impact and uh, pa paleoclimate impact? And then um, we're trying to link these subsurface geologic models with biogeochemistry and hydrology to understand the implications for solute fluxes. Um, so I talked a little bit about the, um, you know, thinking about this model for denitrification on agricultural fields and how that depends on the flow paths, um, you know, through the subsurface and how these flow paths through the subsurface themselves depend on the underlying geology. And so if we know something about the underlying geology and the, the critical zone architecture of these landscapes, and we can maybe better predict, um, you know, uh, how to deal with the, uh, the um, um, you know, nitrate loading in streams. Um, one sort of path forward on this, this is uh, work from uh, Tesoriero, Tesoriero and others um, looking at the, uh, uh, using the geology to say something about the depth at which the probability of oxic groundwater decreases to 50%. So this is, you can think of this as the, um, the, the thickness of this oxic zone in the near surf, in the shallow subsurface. And this varies systematically with those same gradients as the sort of underlying geology and the sort of climate um, impact. So the glaciated versus unglaciated, there's a strong uh, contrast there. Um, we're starting to do this. Uh, this is work from Sue Brantley and others uh, that started as part of a class uh, to look at sort of patterns of the thickness of the depth to pyrite underneath uh, the, the river channel as you move downstream in the Shavers Creek watershed. And thinking that maybe this pattern in the spatial pattern in the depth of pyrite can help explain some of the watershed uh, scale patterns of denitrification that we're uh, starting to map in the, in the Shavers Creek watershed. Um, and so this is uh, a, a flyer from um, one of, uh, a, of what's what we call a community snapshot sampling day for Shavers Creek, um, where uh, uh, we sort of organized a, a group with Trout Unlimited to go and get just citizen scientists to take stream, set, stream samples um, to get data sets that can help us answer these types of uh, questions. Okay, so uh, the last slide here. To conclude, um, the critical zone architecture reflects these geologic, climatic, and anthropogenic legacies and the landscapes. And the integration time or the memory of the landscape depends on that thickness of the critical zone and the erosion rate. Um, in Pennsylvania, there's a strong contrast in the memory of these sandstone and shale watersheds with, that has implications for reading the landscape response to past changes and predicting the subsurface critical zone architecture. And then the Shavers Creek watershed in central Pennsylvania appears to be more resilient to soil erosion than the Piedmont watersheds. And so we're, this is um, really sp spurring a lot more work uh, to try to untangle the drivers and implications of this, both for, um, you know, for soil erosion, but also for, for nutrient loading. Uh, so I'll leave it there. and and take any questions, I guess. Thanks, Roman. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, just uh, raise your hand, I'll unmute you or use the chat box. We did have a question from Tao. Um, as far as you know, is there any particular practice of land management in coal farm which explains the, legacy, the absence of legacy sediments from the mill dams? Ah, uh, um, I think, you know, I think we don't have any, we don't have any clear um, historical records. We're starting to dig into this, um, but we don't have a good answer on that right now, other than sort of different, um, sort of different waves of settlers from different, you know, uh, from, from different regions originally. So probably brought different 
farming practices, but we haven't we haven't looked into the sort of social science aspect of that in in more detail. But good question. Okay, so Jordan Hayes has a question here. Um, you spoke of Nikki's interpretation of more efficient transport on the north facing hill slopes at Shale Hills. I'm wondering about the efficiency of transport based on aspect at Garner Run. Um, if I recall correctly, the Garner Run fine grain soils are prominent in the north facing slope, whereas larger grains or boulders are more prominent in the south facing slope. Is this connected with the transport efficiency? Yeah, so the question that Jordan's asking is about um, whether we see a similar contrast in efficiency at Garner Run as Shale Hills, and I think we do. The fact that the solid fluxion lobes are all coming from that south facing slope, I think is a similar um, underlying pattern um, as at Shale Hills. The challenge at Shale Hills is we don't preserve that record very well because the shales are um, finer grained and we don't preserve that surface morphology uh, is long because they can be smoothed out by by modern temperate processes. So Dorothy asks, Dorothy Merritts asks, uh, it seemed that you reported no mill dam near coal farm and hence no particular grade control structure if there had been any fine grain sediment that could have been trapped, correct? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, I, I think part of this could be a scale issue in that there's probably lots of smaller grade control structures that might not be captured in the you know, the, in the landscape. Um, I, my sense is that um, it's possible that, you know, the, the material from Coal Farm, if there was heightened erosion, could have bypassed that valley fill, which I think is what you're getting at. Um, but the, so that's, I think, one of the reasons we're concerned about thinking about, um, you know, if there was, if there was regional storage within Shavers Creek, because we know we do have uh, mill dams downstream of Coal Farm. So I think the absence throughout the throughout Shavers Creek of of those accumulations, we're sort of using that to help um, help with that interpretation. All right. Um, Lou Derry asks, "What does the difference in residence time between the uh, fractured bedrock and soil at Shavers tell you about the soil production rates, etc.?" Um, that's a that's a Good question. I think um, I don't know. I don't know if Nikki's. I, th I see Nikki's name on here, so I don't. I don't know if Nikki wants to take that question. I haven't thought. I honestly haven't thought too much about that question at Shale Hills, um, but maybe maybe Nikki has some insight. Um, I think. I mean, one in one in one sense, it's it's going to be. It's, I think it's challenging to use the tools that, like the, the tools that we have for measuring soil production rates. I think it's challenging to disentangle when that production happening, because we're oftentimes are um, integrating over, you know, sort of times where you had higher soil production and lower soil production. So, you know, I think, I think in that sense, it, it's going to be uh, for, if you're thinking about the conversion from you know, fractured rock to soil that um, it should, there should be some feedback in there in terms of fracturing the rock, helping to facilitate modern soil production from tree roots and things like that. But yeah, I don't know if, you, if we have the, quite have the tools to dis disentangle that. Okay, Nikki says she doesn't have a mic on her computer, so sorry. Um, but she's gonna start typing some stuff out. And Nikki, you can type to everybody, I think. Maybe every, if you switch the two to uh, all attendees, then maybe everyone can see your um, response. Um, Way asked, do the glacial deposits have a great impact on the weathering of the local bedrock? Um, so we don't, in Shave Creek, we don't see any glacial deposits, but we do have um, these this paraglacial colluvium. And presumably the, the sort of mantling of um, uh, the hillsides with six meters of, of colluvium is gonna have a, um, is, is strongly gonna impact the weathering 
uh, the weathering of the local bedrock. Um, so I think that like the data we have from the Bear Meadows site where we have uh, a core that goes through the top six meters of uh, paraglacial colluvium and then something like 12 meters of um, underlying saprolite that saprolite, we think the weathering of that saprolite happened prior to the uh, on, you know, prior to the quaternary. So this is prior to the onset of periglacial um, climates. So there's a long history there that I think is is really tricky to unpack. We've tried to look at some bulk element analysis to see if we can see weathering profiles in that um, material, but it's really complicated by the fact that. Um, we're in, you know, the, that, that, that bedrock there is in the Juniata formation, which is um, pretty stratigraphically variable. And there's a lot of differences just stratigraphically, so it's hard to, to pick out a clear weathering signal. Um, so Dorothy Meritz asks, if, <clears throat> if silt in the upper parts of the critical zone thickens southward, south of the LGM ice margin, uh, is there a way to determine this somewhat readily? Um, so areas to the south might have more fine grain sediment, especially silt and soil profiles. Is there a way to get the thickness over a large span of the landscape? This could be one factor in the greater amounts of erosion and sedimentation in historic times. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a sense of this. I mean, one, I guess one challenge of looking at this in the Piedmont is that um, this, if you've eroded that material, if you've eroded that fine grain material off the hillsides, it might be tricky to, to sort of find controls where you can compare, um, you know, sort of in uh, unaffected uh, hillsides. So, um, it, I don't, I don't have a good sense on whether whether or not you could, like, make an isopack map of of uh, silt thickness across the whole Susquehanna. But that would be that would be great. All right, so Nikki says, I think the fractured rock residence time comes from the original soil production rates from U series from model and applied to the thickness of the fractured rock seen in the shallow geophysics. Yes. Ah, Missy says, it strikes me that you can't really speak of quote, soil production on a hill slope that has 600,000 years of sediment accumulation. That is not mobile regolith. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really uh, that's a really good point. I think the soil production that we're talking about, um, you know, is is mainly on the is is mainly the 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 work in the shale hills uh, catchment. Um, it's hard to you know I think the the sort of insulation of the the bedrock in um, in the Garner Run yeah precludes this sort of notion of steady state and interpreting uh, uh, soil production rates for sure. Um, do you have a sense of the contrast between the two rock types and how the connectivity to the underlying bedrock speaks to resilience? Um, yeah, do you mean by, by connectivity, do you mean the, the, the sort of like a, like a, just a structural connectivity, like access to the bedrock from surface waters, or do you mean sort of a direct genetic link between the underlying rock and the soils overlying? The ability to produce, the ability to ac actually produce sediment from the bedrock. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in Garner Run, for example, when you have eight meters of Colluvium um, sitting on top of bedrock. Uh, I don't. I don't. I, I don't imagine you have any actual, you know, conversion from be the be the rates of conversion from bedrock to colluvium have, have got to be basically shut down uh, on shorter on you know more recent time scales. So the the probably the connection there is the soils that are derived from you know the soil generation that's associated with dust input and then any, any weathering of the colluvium itself as the parent material. So it it, it, I think it quickly becomes a messy problem to try to think about this um, in terms of, of sort of classic steady state um, models for sure.
Any last minute questions? That was great, Roman. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who came. Um, Thanks, everyone. Our next talk will be with Roger Bales from UC Merced, April 22nd at 3.30. So please come back and join us. Thanks, Roman. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. I've got some questions and comments I'll send you by email. Great. See ya. Thanks again.